Birth Control and Free Speech The Outlook, November 30th, 1921 What Don Marquis, the delightful humorist of the New York Sun, would playfully call a little group of serious thinkers, has been carrying on a not altogether wisely directed agitation in favor of birth control. The law now forbids the dissemination of information regarding the means of preventing conception. The leader of the movement, Mrs. Margaret Sanger, would not only abolish the law, but would establish clinics at which medical information and instruction regarding birth control could be obtained by married women, whose health might be endangered by childbearing. As a part of her public agitation, Mrs. Sanger arranged to hold a meeting in the town hall, New York, on Sunday evening, November 13th, and a number of ladies and gentlemen of unimpeachable respectability acted as a committee endorsing the meeting. The purpose of the meeting was not, Mrs. Sanger protests, to discuss what we may perhaps be permitted to call bluntly the technique of birth control, but to debate the question whether it is moral to discuss the subject in general terms and to urge the abolition of the prohibitionary law. The chief speaker was Mr. Harold Cox, editor of the Edinburgh Review, one of the oldest and formerly most conservative periodicals in the English-speaking world. But before the meeting was even called to order or a word was uttered, the audience was forcibly ejected by the police, the speakers prevented from making their addresses, Mrs. Sanger was arrested, and the meeting was broken up in great disorder. This action of the police was taken, as is now practically acknowledged, on the instigation of the Roman Catholic hierarchy of New York City. The outlook is not in sympathy with Mrs. Sanger's methods and it is very doubtful about the good taste and wisdom of discussing the subject of birth control, which is properly a medical and scientific subject, in a public hall before a popular audience. But it cannot let the violent interference of the police on such an occasion pass without a protest. It was clearly a dangerous and, we think, illegal violation by the police of the fundamental right of free speech guaranteed by the United States Constitution, and moreover it was carried out in a very brutal fashion. The remedy to be pursued, if any remedy was needed, was to invoke the statutory law. The police might have had representatives present, or Archbishop Hayes of the Roman Catholic Church might have had a representative present, and if any of the speakers had uttered words or advocated acts which are contrary to the statutes, they then might have been arrested on a criminal charge. To suppress a public meeting by force, as was done in this case, is simply to pursue the methods of Philip II of Spain, or of the government of the Romanovs in Russia. Archbishop Hayes regards birth control as a sin against the divine law and destructive of society. The Methodist Church denounces round dancing as a sin against the divine law and destructive of society. Let us suppose that the mayor of the city of New York were a Methodist, that the chief of police were a Methodist, and that the Methodist hierarchy had a very potent if not controlling influence in the city administration. Let us suppose that an association of dancing masters called a public meeting in the town hall to discuss the question, is round dancing moral? If the police interfered, broke up the meeting, drove the speakers from the stage and arrested the chairman, it is easy to imagine the protests that would go up all over the city, not less in the city hall than anywhere else, over such puritanical despotism and such a violation of the constitutional liberties of American citizens. We do not think the analogy is far-fetched.